Hello, everybody. Uh, after some time off, I'm over the moon to welcome you all back to another webinar day with Charity Digital. It's great to have our returning listeners back with us. And uh, for the first time as out there, we hope today's session will be the first of many with the Charity Digital webinar community. We've had a lot happen since the last time we spoke to you. Earlier this month, we announced we'll be hosting our very first virtual conference, Digital Fundraising Day, uh, where we'll be running a bunch of webinars, podcasts, videos, and articles that will help charities make the most of digital tech to exceed their fundraising goals. We'll have guests like Trillium, the Katie Piper Foundation, Cats Protection, Lightful, and Comic Relief, to name just a few. Uh, and the day will cover a range of, uh, of sessions suitable for charities of all sizes. We've had over 850 signups so far, uh, and it's completely free for charities to attend. Uh, we'd love to have you join us on the day. Um, to find out more information and sign up, you can head over to digitalfundraisingday.org.uk um, after this webinar. Also, this week we launched our very first podcast episode, podcast episode sorry, which we're super excited about. Uh, in our first season, we'll be chatting with charity guests about key topics like digital fundraising, digital strategy, digital marketing, and security. And we also, we'll also be tackling key issues like inclusivity, inclusivity in the sector and how digital ethics needs to be a bigger focus for, for more organizations. We'll bookend all that with some of the latest digital news, product updates, and, and the odd laugh here and there. Our first episode is the beginning of a larger discussion we'll be having around inclusion in the charity sector. Our guest host and former charity comms editor, uh, Sushila Jukapa, is joined by Brand By Me founder Colette Philip Keane and our very own Rabia Fazil for a real discussion about their experiences, their experiences as women, women of colour working for charities. You can listen to the episode on our site, charitydigitalnews.co.uk, or through your usual podcast provider, be that Apple, Google, Spotify, or any of the many others out there. Um, head over, take a listen, and we'd really appreciate it if you could rate us and subscribe us once you've had a, had a look at it. So on to the subject at hand today. Um, today's webinar comes off the back of a conversation we've been having for a while here, actually, at Charity Digital. The charity sector suffers more than any other when it comes to reaching an audience via email. It's widely considered that as much as 25% of marketing emails never actually make it to the person they're intended for. Inboxes are becoming more secure, which um, is great in so many ways. Um, but as charities working to drive impact change and all around support and guidance, um, being able to reach supporters and benefic beneficiaries not only helps our organizations grow, but delivers valuable information to those who need it most. So we got in touch with our in-house email guru, Elizabeth Carter, and asked her to bring some top tips and industry secrets to help charities break through these pesky spam filters. But before we dive into that, as usual, we need to do a bit of housekeeping. Um, quick reminder that we'll be hosting a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, so make sure you stick around for that. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you can do so at any time by hitting the Q&A button at the bottom center of the screen. Um, if you happen to run out of time before your question is asked, we do record the answers um, once we wrap up and we add them to the recording we share with you via email uh, and on YouTube next week. So that's enough from me for now. I'd like to hand over to Liz. Welcome, Liz. Uh, thanks for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for the introduction. And as Chris has said, my name is Elizabeth. And I've been working for Charity Digital for over 10 years now as their e-comms project manager. I've done lots of webinars and trainings over the years, but it's a pleasure for me to do this one in this setting. So thank you everyone for coming on board and I hope you'll enjoy the webinar as much as I will presenting it to you. Now, today's topic is um, looking at nine ways your charity can spam proof its email marketing. And that will incorporate nine reasons why your emails go into spam. So here's an overview before we dive in and we will be looking at what is spam and spam filters, nine reasons why some emails go into spam and tips on what you can do to help your emails not fall, fall into spam. So firstly, let's start off by talking about spam itself. Now everyone has heard of spam and everyone at one time or another has received a spam email or in my case more than one and spam is also known as junk mail which is unsolicited bulk messages sent via email. 
In other words, the recipient has not specifically asked to join the relevant mailing list or the information sent out from that list does not match to what they think they signed up for. A spam bot. I'm sure you've all heard of spam bots as well, but maybe you're not too sure what they are. Basically, a spam bot is a program designed to collect and harvest email addresses from the internet in order to build mailing lists for sending unsolicited mail, which is other, otherwise known as spam. Okay, spam bots are web crawlers and they can gather email addresses from websites or news groups or special groups or chat room conversations and so on. Now this type of activity can affect your email marketing. An example of this we can all probably relate to and it's been happening quite a lot recently is that your account has been abused by a spam bot. Lately there have been Russian ones and immediate action has to be taken to remove the fraudulent contacts that have found their way into your account via a sign up form on your website. So there's, there's one way of resolving this would be to place a capture on your website so that bots can't fill out your sign up form maliciously or you can implement a double opt in process. So that's now your spam and your spam bot. Before we go any further, let's just have a quick look at some of the worldwide email statistics. 269 billion emails were sent in 2017, and this is expected to rise to 333 billion emails in, in 2022. So there is approximately 4.3 billion email users in the world. This just goes to show that email marketing is definitely not dying out, and neither will it be replaced by social media. Now, the question is, how many of these emails sent are actually spam? It may surprise you to see that nearly 50% is spam. In the middle, we can say 20, 45% uh, of all email spam, so that's nearly 50%. In um, 2018, 55% of emails contain legitimate content, while the rest of it forms into the spam category. Now, spam is a worldwide issue, but certain countries have it worse than others. And you can see on the right hand side of the slide that this is a ranked list of countries um, which, which shows the ones where they have the most live spam issues ongoing and um, the US um, having more to worry about than any other country. Now the big question is on everyone's lips is why? If my emails are genuine, why are they going into spam folders? Well, there's two main points for this ongoing problem. We have the first point as spam filters. Now, spam filters work on inbound and outbound emails, and mailbox providers use both methods to protect their customers from spam. So spam filters use algorithms in their filtering, and algorithms are basically rules that tell a filter what to do, and each rule working on a message assigns a numeric score to the probability of the message being classified as spam. We've got three filters here that I'm just going to touch on. Um, these are the, the main basic ones. You've got the gateway filter, which are servers that receive all email messages sent to a company and decide whether to allow the email to go further or not. The gateway spam filter sort of learns to differentiate between legitimate emails and spam ones based on all the messages sent to that company. Now the hosted filters are different because they belong to the companies. They have elaborated their own method to distinguish legitimate and spam emails based on the content and sender reputation metrics. And also we've got our desktop filters which are installed on the user ends computer and are configured by the user. Now these can be one of the most difficult filters to get through. So that is the first point that we're dealing with. Now the second point that we're going to move on to is the involvement of subscriber engagement. Okay, now when web mail providers decide on which emails make it into the inbox, they look at two points. 
They look at your engagement levels as your subscriber engagement plays a massive role in email de deliverability. And they also look at your recipient behavior. And we are going to look into this in more detail in the next slides by going over nine reasons why your emails are not being delivered and looking at some of the ways that can make them be delivered. Then I will give you a, just a bit more advice and tips on how to get that deliverability down to a key. Let's move on and we'll start with our number one. You didn't get permission to email. Now, I am hoping that post GDPR, this won't be causing an issue with anyone here, but it is important to go over the main points so that you always have in mind and put them into practice. Consent requires a positive opt-in with no pre-tick boxes, especially a yes, sign me up pre-tick box. Keep your consent request separate from your other T's and C's. Make it easy for people to withdraw their consent at any time. Always keep evidence of consent given by way of who, when and how and review your current permission practices and your existing consents to see whether they are up to scratch, up to standard. Let's move over to number two. Your subscribers don't remember or recognize you. It is possible that your email recipient may have forgotten all about you and that they gave the permission to you ages ago and that now they report you as spam. Now bear in mind, this is an important thing to think about, okay? That every time an email is reported as spam, legitimate or not, the complaint gets recorded by the mailbox provider. And as soon as the complaints exceed a certain threshold, all future campaigns skip the inbox and are sent directly to the spam folder. So it is essential to always keep your data list fresh and up to date in order that you're not mailing with very old data. And also make sure that the branding in your emails is memorable and matches the branding on your website. This includes any images, colors or styles of writing. Another essential point is to make sure that the friend you from line in your email is a name that your email recipients can recognize. For example, when our emails go out from Charity Digital News, they go out from Damala at Charity Digital News, or if you're receiving an email from me, then it would be from Elizabeth from Charity Digital Mail. And don't change this name too frequently. We'll move on to number three. An inactive email account or barely used. Now, an inactive email account is an account that hasn't been used for a long time or is rarely used for emailing or receiving emails. The issue here is that the mailbox providers use spam filtering algorithms, again, to review the ratio of active to inactive email accounts. So if you are emailing to high quantities of email addresses that hardly are used by the email recipient, then this will activate the spam filters. Again, I would recommend cleaning up your data list and filtering out the email contacts that haven't opened up your emails for a long while so that you're not engaging with these type of people. And also, if they haven't been engaging with you, it's just best to put them to one side. We shall swiftly move over to reason number four. You have low engagement metrics. Okay. Top webmail providers look at how many emails are opened and how many are deleted without being opened as a factor in their spam filtering decisions. So I've written down three of the common main ones here. Let's quickly go over these definitions. An open is registered when the image in your email has been enabled. This could be automatic by default or manually or a link has been clicked on. Unit clicks refer to the individual email recipient that are clicking on your links within your email. And your clicks to open is the total amount of unique clicks divided by the total number of unique opens. And that's given as a percentage. 
If your click-through rate is low, then you can be sure that the content isn't resonating with your audience or your call to action isn't clear enough or your link to click on that call to action. So the point here is if you have low opens or click through rates, your emails are at a higher risk of being flagged as spam. Now the matrix that you can see on this slide um, below here, these are taken from MailChimp's 2018 benchmark statistics. And these show that the non-for-profit sector has an average open rate of 24%, just over, and has a click-through rate of just over 2.5%. So these are your average ones that you can just sort of guide yourself with. Let's have a look at reason number five. Your IP address has been used by someone else for spam. Okay. If you are sending your emails, through an email marketing platform. Your email is delivered through their service. And it could happen that if other companies are sending spam through the same platform, this could affect your deliverability too. So the problem here is that even if you've never sent spam emails yourself, your emails could get flagged up as spam if the IP address was used by someone else for spam. Now, what I do recommend is that you find um, an email marketing platform that is vigilant about keeping their sending reputation intact. And this email marketing platform uh, should have very strict um, procedures and regulations in place to prevent this type of issue from happening. Some of the things that you would need to look out for would be your transport layer security and your anti-DOS um, DDoS D, um, technology. The website, the web login page, that all data is virus scanned, the service is constantly monitored for viruses, um, authentication and validation systems. And at the end of this presentation, um, actually on the website, there will be a list um, and a link that you can go into and you can access a more comprehensive view of this if you want to look into it in more detail. Moving swiftly on to the sixth reason. Your subject line looks misleading or confusing. Okay. Your subject line and your pre-header effectively make the email recipient open up your email or not. Here we've got an example of your sender and you've got awesomesumpost.com, you've got your subject line, the quickest way to increase email opens, and you've got your pre-header text. Now your subject line is, the best friends of your subject line is literally your pre-header. And this is the first snippet of text that your readers will read before they open up your email. The subject line and the pre-header should go together to tell a story and they should coordinate. There are some ways that you can improve on your subject titles, and here are some of them. Use a clear, concise, simple, and no-nonsense title. Avoid using white spaces and use of dates. Avoid you and your wording to speak directly to your audience. Avoid using explanation marks and all caps in the subject title, as these are food for spam catches. Use subject, use split testing to see which subject title works best and also the number of characters. Remember that a long subject line won't be uh, viewable on mobile devices. And you might find it surprising to know that emojis do work with helping to increase your open rates and don't seem to get caught up in spam. Also, by using keywords, you can entice your email recipients to open up your emails to read more. For example, you'll use words relating to curiosity. So you're picking away the reader's interest without having to give away too much information. Or use urgency, or you might use the humanity element, such as thanking your subscribers, tell them a real life story, or make a human appeal for the retention. Now here, I've just put down some examples of subject titles using curiosity that will probably spark the attention of your subscribers to read on. Four lessons we learned from listening to teens. We're trading wine for answers urine. I think I'll definitely open that one myself. 
and um, why I kind of hate surveys and this month's newsletter will blow your socks off. So if you move on to number seven, we'll find another reason. You're not using or you're not including and you are using a, a, an unsubscribe link, but it's not visible enough. So by law, all your email communications sent through email marketing platforms require a working unsubscribe link. And this is generally displayed at the bottom of the email, although you could have it at the top as well. Um, you really need to make sure that this link is visible and it's better to get an unsubscribe client than, than one that clicks on the spam button. If they cannot find your unsubscribe link within a few minutes, then they're more likely to get a bit frustrated and they will go for that spam. So I have seen um, emails that have been sent out whereby it's been quite impossible to find the unsubscribe link because the font has been so small, like size four, and also it hasn't been visible enough and this is just not acceptable. Also, when someone has unsubscribed, you need to process this unsubscribe request quickly and efficiently and make sure that they are suppressed from receiving any more of your emails. Okay, we now have two more reasons left. So let's look at number eight. Spam words in your subject title and in your email content. Some spam filters are triggered by certain words in the email line and in the body of your email. Now, I've just detailed some of them here that you should not be using. Promise you free risk, cancel at any time, click here, free, great offer, guarantee, amazing, um, dear friend, and, and so on. Now, there are lots of them. So again, on the website, there is a link um, to a more detailed list of these if you would like to read up on what not to use. If you are using a good email marketing platform, they will no doubt have the, a spam filter testing feature incorporated, or if not, you can use other platforms such as Litmus, Email on Acid, or Ice Not Spam that are online spam checkers. And these help you to test um, your emails by alerting you if it's likely to trigger any spam filters. Now, Let's move on to the last but not least of reason. We're going to look at number nine. Your emails don't follow the best HTML practices. Okay. Which is in a nutshell. Use a maximum content width of 60 to 800 pixels. I personally would recommend no more than 700 pixels wide and keep your HTML code as simple and clean as possible. If you are copying and pasting from other resources uh, and other sources, then you need to make sure that the text has passed through Notepad before you insert it into your email, as this can cause clashing of font tags and the font tag style will eventually display differently on various browsers when you send your email out. Keep your image to text 50-50 ratio. So what you really need to avoid doing is sending out a whole image-based email, okay? Always optimize for mobile. Your emails must be responsive and display well and stack well on all smart devices. Um, according to Campaign Monitor, about 53% of emails are opened up on mobile devices so make sure that your emails are readable and load quickly and your buttons have the appropriate size for the finger touch. Your images. Compress your images first before uploading them so you're not using super high resolution images or any other media with a large file size. Okay, don't use obscure dark fonts as these can throw up challenges, um, especially for accessibility. And you want to be using fonts that work across email server platforms like Arial, Vedana, Georgia, and Times New Roman. A lot of clients do ask me if they can use their web branding font in their email campaigns. And my short answer is no and yes. You can use these. 
but they won't render well on all browsers and will revert back to Times New Roman on some. So it is best um, to stick to the standard fonts that are offered within the email marketing platform. So now, we've gone over nine reasons why your emails may not be delivered, okay? And I've given you some of the ways that you can change this as well. So let's now have a look at a few more things that you can do to avoid your emails going into spam. And that's just to remind you what I'm doing and me too. <laughs> links. Make sure that all the links within your email go to the right place and that aren't broken and avoid inserting full links in your email as these can flag up spam filters instead of inserting the full link then you would disguise this and place a link over words as you can see here in the example so instead of putting www.charitydigital.org.uk i will put this as charity digital and i will put the link behind this so, and i would underline it and put it in a different color maybe so that people know that it's a link um, that you actually need to click on another bit of advice I'll have, I have for you is to use a custom from address. Now, if you're finding that your emails are not being delivered on a regular basis, then you might want to think about using a custom from address email and so that your recipients will only see your brand, like the example I've put down here. So this is John Smith at example.com. The domain is his branded one. And before that is just the mailbox name. Using a custom from address will help you to increase your open rates and most email marketing platforms offer custom from addresses which are fully configured for authentication and this will confirm to the internet service provider that you are who you say you are. I know that some email marketing platforms charge different rates um, to buy a custom from address um, and that will be something that you would talk to your email marketing um, service provider about. Another bit of advice for you. This is a useful tip. And you ask your subscribers to whitelist your emails, whether these are welcome ones or whether they're regular newsletters, as this will help to increase your sender reputation and your inbox delivery rates will be higher overall. I would recommend just inserting a sentence somewhere prominent in your email that asks your email recipients to do this. I have seen it on quite a few emails that it's right up at the top where you have the link that says view online and then a lot of people have been putting at the top of the email, please whitelist our email. There are different mechanisms and different ways that you can whitelist your email and on the website there will be a list um, to actually give you more information on how to advise your subscribers to white whitelist their emails or your emails. Moving on to another very important mechanism, and this is a preference center. When you offer a preference center, whether this will be for a sign up or for the email recipient that which to unsubscribe, you're providing a centralized portal and that we're giving them the opportunity for your subscribers to control what they receive and how often they receive it. Now, it is possible that some of your subscribers will fall out of love with your emails or start to feel some email fatigue. So to avoid this from happening, it's better to know what your subscribers really want to hear about and then to email them with irrelevant content, what they don't want to receive is emails that really just don't apply to them. And that will just put them off and that will make them not want to open up your emails. So whilst we're on the subject of being more targeting and engaging with your subscribers, another essential method to have and always to think about is to segment your data. Now, Lyris found that 39% of marketers who segmented their email lists experience higher open rates, 28% experience lower unsubscribe rates, 
and 24% experience better deliverability and greater revenue. So segmentating your list based on demographics such as location or past behavior or interests will really help you to be more targeted and engaging to increase your open rates. But the question is, what about email bounces in all of this? You need to examine them. I have put down the most common types of bounces. When an email bounces, you will be given a reason for this bounce. A hard bounce relates to contacts whose email addresses are permanently unreachable, most likely because um, they or the server they were hosting on don't exist. A soft bounce are contacts whose email addresses are temporarily unavailable, possibly because their mailbox are full or their server is having temporarily issues accepting mail. An ISP complainer are the dreaded contacts who click on the spam button or link and submit a spam complaint via the internet service provider. And now the mail blocker happens when a when contacts have received the message and the provider doesn't want to process this, possibly, possibly because of attachments or other reasons there. If you do recognize a pattern in your bounces, then you can try and contact the email administrator of the server you're trying to send your emails to and you can find out why they're being blocked and ask, ask them to whitelist um, the emails. And lastly, I'm now going to talk about the challenges presented by Gmail. Gmail does recommend, well, first of all, that actually the main thing to consider, I'll just go into this, when sending to Gmail is that the mail classifications depend heavily on reports from users. Also, Gmail has um, filters set up to, deter to, to determine which category an email belongs in. Um, in addition to the anti-spam filters, Gmail organizes the inbox based on categories such as promotional, social, and primary. And we've all got Gmail accounts, no doubt, and we all know how this works. But your Gmail users can mark and unmark messages as spam, so they can move non-spam messages between these tabs. So Gmail learns from user corrections, and over time automatically adjust the classification to match the user's preferences. Now, maybe some Gmail users might have trouble finding your emails because they have been filtered into other tabs like social or promotions. So to make your life easier with sending emails to your Gmail users, Gmail recommends that you verify each email address before subscribing them to your list. Also, avoid email blasts as Gmail is extremely sensitive to mass mailing and it quickly tabs them as promotional email or spam. It's also going to be a bit difficult for beautifully designed HTML emails to land in the primary tab as Gmail looks at your source code and will determine if it's been sent by human or automated. So I would recommend that your design isn't really loaded HTML wise and it's kept as light as possible with few images and lots of text, minimal links and with personalization. Now bear in mind that um, emails sent by massive email providers like MailChimp most likely will go into Gmail promotional tab as the majority of these users are sending out marketing emails. So it's a good thing to remind your Gmail contacts that if your email arrives inside of the promotional tab, they need to click, drag and drop it into the primary tab. Also, ask them to add your email to the contact list from the email menu option in Gmail, as this will automatically put all your subsequent emails in the primary tab. So, we have looked at lots of content today that has been delivered in a very short space of time. And just to wrap up, we have seen that email spam or junk mail, as it's still, it's, as it's called, is very much still a problem in this present day and age. We know that spam filters are part and parcel of the email delivery process. We can't do anything about that, and that is a good thing. 
We've also seen that you can't fully control how an email is being labelled to these spam filters, but you can control a lot of factors that might lead emails flagging up as spam. Now, I know that I've loaded you with lots of information that you'll need time to digest, but now the time has come to turn the tables over to you and open up this webinar to all of your questions. Thanks very much for that, Liz. Um, some great insights as, uh, as always. Um, I suppose in terms of a, um, a, a case study for, for a lot of that Google stuff you were just going through, um, there's no better place to kind of look than, our, than ourselves. Um, a couple of months ago, we were actually kind of, we were going through a similar thing where we were, we realized and highlighted that a lot of our emails weren't being delivered. Um, and when we kind of deep dived into that and had a look in the, and got in the weeds, it, it seemed as if it, those emails that weren't being reached were, were Gmail accounts. Um, and we've since been on that journey that you've just been sharing with everybody and I'm just starting to see the, the rewards on, of that now. So in terms of a sort of quantitative case study then, um, mm -hmm. we can be used as, as, as an example for that, but thanks very much. Um, as you already said, it's time to dive into some questions. We've had six or seven come in already. Um, if you want to, if you want to add one to the list, hit the Q and A button button on the bottom of your screen there, and um, and submit. Um, but we we'll start at the very beginning. It's usually the best place to start. Um, the first question is, what do you recommend doing when a campaign throws up a warning sign in Gmail? Okay. Um... Uh, just lately, the warning sign has been something similar to this. Be careful with this email. It contains content that's typically used to steal personal information, okay? And in their Gmail account. Um, I'm not sure if you're all aware, but a few months ago, Gmail has been implementing machine learning as a way of anti-spam intelligence. And unfortunately, there have been some situations whereby emails have been wrongly marked of phishing attempts. So there is an ongoing discussion within the email industry regarding this issue. And we know um, it's affecting senders across the board, but it's not an isolated situation just for any account. It's sort of related to all of us. So that's ongoing at this time. Great, thanks very much. Um, the next question is, how do I know if my email has fallen Oh, hang on, I've lost it, sorry. <laughs> How do I know if my email has fallen into the person's spam folder? Is, is there a metric that covers this? Maybe a, a non-open, for example? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. And I wish I knew the answer myself. Um, yeah, if, if your email, you don't really know if your email has been delivered straight into the spam folder. We don't know. We just got to keep an eye on their opens. And if they haven't been opening up emails for a long time, or if they've complained to you that they haven't received any emails, then you can bet your bottom dollar that your emails are going into their spam. Mm -hmm. Great, Th thanks Liz. Um, next up is, if I deal my organization's address in my footer, would this help my emails from not going to spam? Yeah, um, th this is um, actually, um, I've been asked this before, should I be putting more in my footer? Um, would that make uh, my emails sort of be delivered safely? Um, if you're located um, in the USA, yes, this would help as their spam, their spam laws are different to the European ones. And insert, inserting a physical address in your filter is a requirement. But in Europe, however, it, it won't really make much more of a difference, but I do recommend that you have that information in your footer anyway, and make your footer quite prominent. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I think you've kind of mentioned that a few times, keeping things prominent that, you know, we often by nature try to hide um, yeah. is actually a good way to, to sort of get past those filters. I think that, that's a useful takeaway for everybody. We all want to hide the underscore and subscribe button. No, no hiding at all. Everything has to be really visible. Transparency is the key. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Love it. Um, next question. Uh, what shall we, what, what shall a charity consider as low engagement metrics for the industry? I know we covered this earlier in the webinar, but might be good to flesh out again. 
yeah, do you know, a couple of years ago, um, the metric was actually 18%, that was average. And now it's gone up to 20, 24%. Now, something that you have to bear in mind here with an open, okay? An open is only registered when the email has been opened by default or manually opened. So there might, and, it, and a link has been clicked on. So they might have read your email, but they haven't done either, but they still read it. So you can't use your open rate as really strict and measurable in that respect. The best metric to use would, would be your um, uh, open, um, open to click one there. Um, but I would say that if you're getting anything lower than 18%, I would be a bit concerned. Mm -hmm. Of course, it depends if you're, but if you're mass mailing, then you're going to get a lower open rate. If, if you're being very, very targeted and just sending out to a, an engaging audience, then your open rate would be very high. So it all depends on your audience as well. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, I mean, it, like social media, the more followers you have, the less the less engagement you tend to get. It's a similar for email. That you know, the the further you cast your net. Um, the less, like, sort of the less that might that might become through. But if you're more targeted in your approach, like you said, um, exactly. you, you're more likely to get a, a higher engagement rate. Yeah, I, and I have noticed that is a pattern across the board. So the more targeted you are, the better. So that's why I mentioned segmentation, keeping your list clean and up to date, and just to go through all those procedures that I've gone over. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, next question from Sam Gamblin. Do spam filters just link to an individual's inbox? For example, if an individual marked you as spam, does this affect your emails being sent to a platform as a whole? Um, do, are they, yeah, it, it depends on, again, the recipient behavior with that. Um, it depends on what behavior is going on in your inbox because that will have a knock-on effect. And if you're using a domain, like a company domain, that will have an effect on the company as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, the next question from Sam Ford. I don't know, Sam, you might want to follow this. If you're asking us specifically, I pose this more of a general question, but do, um, do we verify G Gmail addresses? Yeah. Now, there are certain ways that you can verify um, Gmail addresses. It depends, first of all, where you got that email address from. If you've purchased it online, I would be slightly concerned that you definitely need to go through a verification process. And some email marketing providers have this feature um, in way of a global, uh, global suppression list. So you can upload your list and then you can compare it to what they have for all of their um, clients and uh, around the world. Um, you can flag up that way or if you are collecting your data, which is sort of more grassroots source, then verifying that that person is who they say there is, is a lot easier to do. It's when you purchase lists, that's a big issue. Yeah, no, I totally get that. Um, next question is from Vicky, and we just had a note to say she actually has to leave, but I want to ask so we get it on the, on the recording for her. Sure. She's asking Liz, if you could clarify segmentation a bit more, please. Sure, segmentation is really, really good to use. Imagine you have a massive um, database and you're uploading all of those contacts into your email marketing platform. And then you say, right, I now want to target maybe my audience that is over 25, that has donated 50 pounds in the last year, and that has been to an event. You, are, you then know their interests. You know that they like donating. You then know that they're actually an adult. You know that they live in this particular area. And then you can target them and say, I just want to target those people um, that have done this activity or that have this interest or um, that have shown um, that they wish to volunteer in the past. So segmentation is used to target in a better, more efficient way your audiences instead of just we'll send out this email and let's see what happens. Um, with segmentation, you can actually be a lot more controlled about who you're sending out to. Magic. Thank you, Liz. And any, yeah. any good, decent email marketing platform will offer the segmentation tool. Yeah. Um, next question from Madeline. 
Uh, is it worth having a marketing email account and a separate transactional account to help sort of transactional emails beat the, beat the filters? Mm, good question. Um, have they still got the same domain would be my point. It depends on your domain. If you're having sort of a, a, an alias for that, um, I assume that they're on different domains and if they are, then that possibly might help. Yes. Um, they're still coming from the same IP though. So I'm really not too sure on that one. <laughs> I would have to go away and think about it and I can follow it up on that one. Um, but there are two things that you have to think about. Do they have still have the same domain? Or are they still using the, I, the same IP address? Great. Um, well, maybe we can circle back around on that one, Liz, and we can include something for, for Madeline in the resources afterwards. Sure. Yes, I think that would be good. Great. Um, next question up from Hannah. Is it possible to know how many of our emails are going straight into spam boxes? No. <laughs> I, I really, really wish we had a metric that would be so clear and straightforward with that, but no. Like I mentioned, the only way is to keep an eye on um, who is not opening them up, who's not clicking on anything. Um, and then again, that's where your segmentation will come into play. That's your behavioral segmentation. So you can um, put to one side the people for the last six months haven't opened up an email, put to one side the people that are not engaging with you by clicks, and then sort of figure out why is this happening, and then come to the conclusion um, they may be falling into their spam folders. If you have somebody that is writing to you saying, I am not receiving these, they're going straight to my spam, then you would have to look into that, not just for them, but also for the organization as a whole. It, what, one thing we did, Hannah, when, uh, when, when we saw a question, we noticed our, um, our open rates were just lower than usual and we'd, we'd made a change to the sort of look and feel of, of how our email was. Yeah. Um, and you know when you know when you change content in what you you know you see as an improvement, you expect to see a, a spike up, not a spike down. Yeah. Um, but what had what what had happened is those changes it it blocked essentially put up spam filters and wasn't getting through. So yeah. we kind of depend on what platform you use, and of course we kind of took a deep dive into our platform, and we were able to to discover exactly which um, which accounts it wasn't being. Um, it wasn't getting to. So yeah. from that, we were able to come up with a sort of a, a plan of action that let us, you know, reach out to Gmail users, for example, that we have on our database. So like, all right, can you just mark us as safe, that sort of thing? Yeah. So, um, that's one possible scenario. And there's also um, features with some email marketing platforms that they let you test your design out. So you can see which design is working better for you as well. Not just that you can uh, split test the subject title, but you can also test the design. Yeah, mm. I think that's really important as well. Like, yeah, A-B a, B testing and split testing to, yes. to see which one's landing better. Yes, exactly. That's very, very important. And you need to spend time to actually do these exercises and then analyze the results afterwards because that will help you greatly in the future with your email marketing. You have to you have to know your audience. Indeed, um, the next question from Sid Rodriguez: uh, Can you talk a bit about ARC email authentication and how we can use that to improve email delivery? Um, just wondering in what capacity um, that question would be. The ARC again. Um, I could, I mean, we can put a link to that afterwards if that would be helpful. Yeah, we can do that. Let's, um, yeah. unless, yeah, Sid, unless you want to come back and clarify your question a bit more. Um, mm -hmm. I think he's added one to the bottom, actually. Uh, we've noticed the percentage of our subscribers have a, a vanity email address, which forwards to catch all account. The deliverability of these email tends to be very low. Is there a way of improving this? Um, you would have to have a look at what, how your campaign is. You would have to look at your subject title. You would literally have to go back to basics, which was what we had to do again with our emails on there. But that's something um, that I can look further into in more detail. Great. Um, we can include something in that in our resources then. Yes. Um, next question. Uh, you mentioned to keep the number of images and links low, but text a little higher. Yeah, so 50 
it's it's difficult if you're targeting gmail then i would sort of go for images a little bit less than text and have more text than images um other outlooks and everything then i would i would always err on caution and do 50 50 ratio with that mm -hmm. yeah make sure that your images are have a good obviously um that that they're, they're good size but the the resolution of the images are, are good but you're not uploading massive ones yeah great is is there a good source of information for that sort of thing um i mean we did an article on that um a few months back so maybe we can do sort of a link on that that would be good of course yeah, yeah of course next question um quick question on the engagement metrics in the table under point four yeah. Uh, were these for the non-profit sector in the UK or if not which region in Europe will wait? I think they were the UK weren't they Liz? Um, the engagement metrics those were overall so and I did, yeah I did take them from UK general overall not just from the non-for-profit mm -hmm. oh, okay but it was was the UK was the non-profit sector listed within it um, if you're talking about the MailChimp um, benchmarks, yes, that was a non-for-profit. Um, those are the metrics. But if you're talking about the stats that, um, that I mentioned, um, then that was the UK general. Great. Thanks for clearing that up. And um, last question from Bob. Um, there are many reasons for non-opens. Non Is it a terrible sin to resend your email to these <laughs> writers? <laughs> Do you know, that's a really good question. Um, and I get that quite a lot. It depends on how you want to look at it, Bob, because um, there, there are facilities to remail your email for the people that haven't opened it up, but I would be a little bit cautious about this. If you are sending out an email that is for a, a specific event and you need someone to be there at a certain time, it's a fundraising or it's something quite urgent, then I would probably look at the non-openers and I would send out an email again, okay? Because I really, really want them to open that up and I need to know the information that is inside of that. If you're sending out sort of a general newsletter, then I'll go back to my point that I made earlier. And that was that an open isn't an exact measurement. They might have read it, but they haven't downloaded an image and they haven't clicked on a link. So you might be remailing information that they've already read. So that's where the dilemma comes in, and that's down really just to personal choice and the, the content of your email. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with um, with Liz on this as well. I think it's never mind the sort of getting through the spam filters. You don't also want to spam your audience. Um, yeah. So I think it's really relative. I kind of base it on content, Bob. Yeah. Um, so I kind of like Liz said, depending on what you're emailing about, um, will kind of determine whether your email or not. Um, yeah, the importance exactly. to the the end user, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, your general sort of newsletter, it's better to use, you know, A-B testing to decide, you know, if subject lines are working or if the content of an email is, is working, for example. Yeah. All right, great. Well, that looks like that's all our, our questions. Um, and that's all of us. That's all from us here at Charity Digital. If you'd like to get in touch with uh, Liz or any of us here, uh, please do so by using the, the contact information you can see on the screen now. Huge thank you again to Liz. Thanks for joining us. Um, and of course, much. thanks to all of you for, for being with us today and for your questions. That was really insightful. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be sending out a recording of this webinar along with some additional resources um, via email um, that should be with you in the next week or so. Um, we'll also be putting it on the Charity Digital News website where you can uh, re-watch and, and, and share with your colleagues whenever, whenever you get a chance. If you'd be so kind, um, we do send a feedback form out after every webinar. Um, it's a quick two-minute survey, and it does go a real long way to help us continuously improve in this, uh, this webinar program that we started this year. Um, we want to bring you the best possible content. Our next webinar will be on November 14th where we'll be joined once more by the amazing Cub from the National Cyber Security Centre for the last in our um, cyber security series. Um, following the frankly terrifying stats about how unengaged the sector is when it comes to cyber security, Cub will be sharing tactics that charity professionals can use to help colleagues and leadership take, take security seriously. You can head over to the Charity Digital News 
www.co.uk forward slash webinars to sign up for that now. And um, we hope to see you on the 14th. Thanks again for today and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.